Hey everybody, Rob here with this week's episode. Um, this week is just going to be an interview um, with someone that we've been reading a lot from uh, and learning a lot from. Uh, um, I'll introduce uh, Vladimir Ischenko in a second, but uh, he is a sociologist and a researcher on Ukraine. And his recent work and podcast appearances, especially his interview on The Dig, which we'll link to in the show notes, has been invaluable for us in helping understand the crisis uh, in Ukraine. And Vladimir has provided not only like the nuances of what's going on in the crisis in the 2014 Maidan revolution, but also a theoretical analysis, a general theory of Maidan revolutions, um, a, a Gramscian analysis of this escalating organic crisis that's going on in post-Soviet countries. And with the new reality of the of the Russian invasion and the now hot war, I think everyone's analysis is turning international. What does this mean for a new global economic order, possible nuclear war? And that's precisely why I want to turn to this more theoretical discussion because of Vladimir and his colleague Oleg's analysis is using the situation in Ukraine and the ongoing crisis to analyze this broader phenomenon of recurring revolutionary moments which seem to change nothing or perhaps just lead to increased nationalism and uh, war. Um, so on that note, uh, Vladimir, I would like to uh, welcome you to Cornish Beatty. Yeah, thank you so much. So I guess we should just get right into it. I uh, said in a few words my impression of your of your theory, but I'd like you to explain in your own words uh, what is a deficient revolution, as you understand it, and what made the 2014 Maidan revolution in Ukraine deficient? Yeah, let's start from the beginning. So, <clears throat> and now many uh, uh, academics who study uh, revolutions, uh, they debate uh, uh, one uh, big question. Uh, what we observe now is the uh, uh, rise of uh, of the revolutions. Uh, the Arab Spring was uh, one of them, but also the post-Soviet revolutions uh, that became known as color revolutions, or we prefer, them to call, prefer to call them as Maidan revolutions uh, for a reason. Uh, that's another thing, but also the revolutions in other parts of the world. And uh, but at the same time, uh, the uh, we see the uh, increasing number of the revolutions, at least in the sense of the change of the government uh, via uh, massive popular mobilization. But we do not see the revolutionary changes, the fundamental changes of the social and political structures. So it's not even the difference between the social revolution that would uh, change the class structure of the society, like the French Revolution in 1789, uh, that started in 1789, or Russian Revolution of 1917, that uh, both led to dramatic changes of the fundamental structures of, uh, structures of, the, of the society. Of, those societies, but we also don't see even uh, quite often we don't even see the change of the political institutions to claim that uh, it is at least some kind of like a limited political revolution. Nothing, some, nothing like uh, move from uh, monarchy to a republic that, for example, happened uh, in the English Revolution of the 17th century. Uh, in, in case of the post-Soviet revolutions, we, we, we see that basically almost nothing is changing. And uh, that, that's a big question. We have more revolutions, but those revolutions are actually less and less revolutionary. And uh, the, there is a big discussion who, what could actually explain this paradox. Uh, some people refer to uh, democratization to um, expansion of uh, liberal democratic institutions that make uh, revolutions less possible and um, some people believe uh, less necessary because why would you need to go for a risk of a revolution if you have some opportunities to change the government via elections. Uh, 
uh, there are many counter arguments against it. Uh, uh, there is an argument uh, in a forthcoming book by Mark Basinger, uh, one of the very prominent political scientists who actually calculated uh, the rate of the increasing number of the revolutions. And he argues that perhaps uh, this paradox may be explained by urbanization. The expansion of the urban environment, uh, 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 first it creates a concentration of power, at the same time it uh, allows uh, more efficient repression and a more efficient expansion of the state, which was uh, not possible uh, in many agrarian rural societies with weak state. And at the same time, it uh, pushes the revolutionaries for specific tactics of changing the government, which would require a very rapid and massive mobilization of the people in the concentrated places. Uh, and that would require uh, very broad coalitions, very vague uh, claims. And in the end, it would lead also to uh, mainly nonviolent uh, tactics. And uh, for, for, for many people uh, take it as something self-evident. As, uh, if you, if the revolutionaries are relying on the nonviolence, that would uh, somehow require also very limited goals of the revolutions. And basically, they. Uh, uh, create uh, this uh, uh, argue for this connection uh, between um, basically they would say that a, a real a really transformative revolution would be necessarily violent because the, then the ruling class would uh, resist and the resistance would require violence and so on and so on and so forth but we actually Within the debate, uh, within the context of this debate, we would rather claim that the limits of the um, transformative potential of contemporary revolutions uh, lie not uh, in the question of violence or non-violence, and not about uh, dem- democracy or or urbanization, but rather in the crisis of counter-hegemony, the crisis of the capacity to lead, to to, to create this uh, connection of uh, uh, political, intellectual, and moral uh, leadership for the uh, revolutionary uh, for the participants of the revolutions. So, uh, going back to why these revolutions are deficient, they are deficient precisely because the, 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 there are uh, real revolutionary aspirations. So, the people who participate in the contemporary revolutions, they, they uh, un- are not happy with simply changing one oligarch for another oligarch. As, uh, typically happened in in post-Soviet revolutions. Uh, like Ukrainian Euromaidan is the greatest example of that. When, uh, and, and, and not even the Euromaidan, uh, but the previous Ukrainian revolution, because we had actually three revolutions in the, uh, in the course of uh, one generation in 1919, 2004, and then in 2014. So the revolution of 2004, which was known as uh, the Orange Revolution, uh, toppled, uh, basically it prevented uh, an attempt to steal the elections by Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, But Viktor Yanukovych, uh, just in two years, was invited as the prime minister in the post-revolutionary government by uh, a revolutionary leader, Viktor Yushchenko, who became a president or instead of Yanukovych. And in five years after the so-called Orange Revolution, Yanukovych became the president of Ukraine. And then he was toppled the second time in 2014 during the Euromaidan Revolution. But the, uh, 
the president who became uh, who who was elected after the Euromaidan revolution was one of the richest Ukrainian oligarchs, Petro Poroshenko. Despite the aspirations of the revolutionary participants, that they are actually protesting against this uh, corrupt, uh, cynical, oligarchic system. So the, there are real revolutionary aspirations that uh, the people are protesting for some fundamental change. But at the same time, those uh, these aspirations, uh, th- those wishes are very poorly articulated on the very level of very vague, very abstract uh, slogans, something like dignity uh, or freedom. These things could be interpreted in multiple ways. These are not the programs, these are not agendas for, uh, for a revolutionary change. And the only more or less clearly defined uh, claims that would really be at the same time unifying for most of the protesters are directed against uh, the leader who they want to topple. So basically the only thing that could unify the Euromaidan protesters was the disgust towards Yanukovych. But th- this is not sufficient for a vision of the revolutionary change. Uh, next, uh, why they are also deficient. The, they are, the revolutionary mobilization is structured in very loose coalitions, uh, which uh, does not provide a, an organizational uh, relation for uh, organizing the uh, different uh, groups participating with, within the revolution in a more uh, efficient, more formalized uh, structures that would be at the same time uh, necessary to uh, push for fundamental changes after the revolutionary event is over. And finally, the, the leadership within the revolution uh, is uh, very weak. There are no strong, authoritative, uh, really trustful leaders. We do not see the real, uh, like, uh, yeah, in Russian, this uh, Vajdi, but yeah, in English, uh, they are literally usually translated as, uh, as, as, uh, as the leaders. So in, in case of the Euromaidan revolution of 2014, the, most of the protesters who were uh, at uh, the Maidan Square in Kiev, they actually despised and mistrusted those opposition leaders who were speaking on behalf of them. They, they, they were no real leadership relation. And uh, so we, we got this uh, combination. Uh, the revolutionary aspirations, uh, revolutionary tactics, uh, non-violent and violent, uh, but at the same time, uh, only vaguely articulated claims, only loosely organized coalition, uh, only weak leadership. And this combination allows uh, for different agents uh, that could play quite different roles in 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 the revolution uh, to hijack uh, the revolutionary legitimacy for their agendas that are not representative for the aspirations of the masses of the uh, revolution's participants, and this uh, this allows uh, the uh, Instead of solving the crisis of the representation, uh, when the people do not see in the political elites uh, their representatives and their leaders, their representatives of their um, interests, uh, the revolution, instead of solving this crisis, it only reproduces the crisis and even intensifies the crisis of representation. So the agents that exploit the revolutionary legitimacy 
they are also not representative for the uh, majority of the revolutionary participants. And, uh, but they get more resources to promote their unpopular agendas. And in this way, they only exacerbate the very crisis the revolution could, was supposed uh, to be uh, a reaction and solution to. Uh, that's quite a long answer. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I want to pick up on a, two things in particular you mentioned, the, the crisis of counter-hegemony and this, this problem of leadership, because your, what, came to my, what comes to mind is your analysis of the Ukrainian left, specifically in 2014, and the fact that there was split, that, that there were progressive forces uh, both in, in the, the Maidan uprising and in the anti-Maidan movements. Could you explain that dynamic and because it seems like it it draws out some of the problems you're talking about yeah it draws because of uh, not every uh, political organization would be capable to hijack this revolutionary legitimacy so for example why it, uh, uh, why it was possible for the radical nationalists because they, in, in the dynamics of the Euromaidan uh, radicalization, it happened that uh, the radical nationalists were actually uh, most prepared and most skillful in the street violence that was uh, tactically required at that stage of the revolutionary development. So they uh, became so visible in the revolution uh, for some good reasons. No other uh, agent of the Euromaidan loose coalition uh, was that effective in, uh, in the radicalization and in the street violence. Uh, in case of the left organizations that uh, indeed participated in Euromaidan, uh, they uh, could not uh, provide for the Euromaidan uh, anything really indispensable. So those organizations were uh, very small. They were also quite uh, disorganized. There was no real coordination among them. So unlike the radical nationalists who were uh, capable to unite very quickly at the start of the revolution into a coalition that became known as uh, the right sector, but uh, in the beginning it was formed from the marginal uh, far-right uh, groups and uh, parties, uh, the left uh, was uh, disorganized. The left was small. The left was not really capable for violence. The left was not bringing any um, indispensable resources, unlike uh, the professional NGO civil society, which was important for you know, creating an international image for the Euromaidan revolution, or the opposition parties, which were very important in uh, supplying the uh, material resources, uh, especially important at the uh, stages of uh, lower mobilization during quite long um, uh, revolutionary event. The Yermatan revolution uh, lasted for about three months. And these were winter months, and uh, winter is quite harsh uh, in Ukraine, so it's not uh, such a pleasure as to stay, for example, at uh, uh, Tahrir Square. Uh, mm. uh, so uh, the left uh, was not, the left participated in Euromaidan, but it was not really necessary. And so uh, it, it could not influence any of the revolutionary events or development in the way they would probably wish to. And uh, th th that, of course, requires a discussion of why uh, this uh, the, the left participation was so weak within Euromaidan, for example, and why, for example, 
the largest party, the largest left party in Ukraine, the Communist Party, did not support the Euromaidan and how they perceived it uh, as, uh, as basically the uh, enemies of the left. And they had the reasons for this because uh, Euromaidan quite quickly turned, got the very clear anti-communist dimension with the attacks on the Lenin's monument in, in Kiev center and his quite important participation of uh, the radical nationalists that were always anti-communist. Uh, so that, that's, that, that's quite, quite, quite a big issue. Uh, and uh, within the anti-Maidan mobilization that started, uh, it actually paralleled uh, Euromaidan at uh, at that moment, it was more like top-down organized by the ruling party of regions that supported Yanukovych. But when Yanukovych was toppled, the anti-Maidan uh, mobilization got its autonomous dynamics and uh, where some uh, pro-Russian, uh, maybe even agents, could play a role. However, the dynamics uh, also had very clear grassroots uh, dimension. And that mobilization was even weaker, even weaker, even um, looser than uh, the Euromaidan mobilization. But uh, the left there could uh, get some more prominent positions, uh, but I'm, I'm speaking about the Communist Party, but also more radical uh, Borodba uh, organization. And they, they indeed, uh, they uh, played quite an important role in the anti-Maidan uh, protests in Kharkov, in Odessa in 2014. But uh, in, on, on, a, on a larger scale, in, 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 within the broader picture, they also could not uh, uh, make any uh, significant uh, um, change uh, of the development of uh, of those mobilization uh, when it was overtaken by the pro-Russian uh, separatist uh, uprising in Donbass. And when the, all that anti-Maidan mobilization went basically into the violent uh, way. Uh, the left was not prepared for violence and they quite quickly became quite irrelevant. And even within the structures of the pro-Russian puppet states in, Don in, the, in Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, the left, uh, even, even, even if the communists actually played uh, quite important part in, in the very beginning of that um, uh, events in Donbass. Afterwards, they were simply pushed aside and completely different people. So the, the, the people were, that were like directly connected to like people in Moscow. Uh, they started to, to play the crucial roles in, in Donetsk and in Lugansk. I think your your work and, and your answers uh, have give a very rich uh, description of what's going on in Ukraine. And it's the theory uh, of the post-Soviet crisis uh, in general that I think is very interesting to me and perhaps would point to some way forward or some solutions um, for the left or, or even just an analysis of what, of what might happen. Um, you, th this is a very broad context and there are three kind of general groups. Maybe I'd like to get to in turn. Uh, they're all interconnected though. So I'd like you to, to pick up at, at, at any point in particular that, that you'd like to start with, but just to, to lay it out um, at the beginning here. Um, you mentioned of the, the post-Soviet countries that have recurring Maidan revolutions are not just Ukraine, but Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan. Um, but that these are, even though this is 
you know, these are deficient revolutions. They are um, the flip uh, the flip side of the coin of uh, the other post-Soviet countries, which have uh, what you call Caesarist or Bonapartist regimes. Uh, you mentioned Russia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and most of Central Asia. And that these countries also have, let's maybe recurring protests, if not, or, or even uprisings. But that there's a, I think there's an interesting interplay going on here. Um, I'm also interested in your analysis of, of Belarus, specifically the, the um, maybe fledgling labor actions that took place there. Um, I'll include a link to your, your notes on Belarus in, in the show notes for the listeners. Um, between these two contexts, I was wondering what fluidity there exists. I mean, a, can a post-Soviet, can, an, can a Caesarist regime be consolidated after a, a Maidan revolution, for example? Um, I'll let you get started, but, but the, third, the third group would be um, not coincidentally, the 2014 Maidan revolution in Ukraine was part of a general sequence of the Arab Spring Occupy Wall Street and the Square revolutions uh, in Western Europe, and I am very curious what differences exist there, uh, what in instructional comparison we can make, and uh, and if broadly speaking there are more opportunities uh, in in a certain place than another uh, beyond just better weather, perhaps. <laughs> mm. Oh, look, this is this a. Too many questions, actually. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll start from the last one, and sure. maybe we'll get back to other uh, later. Um, yeah, uh, I would say that the the, the, the um, in very abstract terms, there is a global crisis of hegemony. There is a global organic crisis, and uh, the uh, um, events like. Post-Soviet Maidan revolutions, but also the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring, uh, the movements of squares, uh, as some other people call them, uh, they are of uh, of the same very broad category. The uh, actually anti-systemic movements, which uh, are not capable for systemic changes. And of course, we, we may discuss the differences, and the, 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 there are differences definitely between the Euromaidan, where the radical nationalist played uh, a prominent role, and the Occupy Wall Street, which was uh, uh, a left-wing movement. Uh, and and we can go to the comparisons between the Soviet Maidan revolutions and the Arab revolutions uh, fighting definite uh, differences. Uh, but I think in, in, in this discussion, maybe this uh, basic commonality is uh, maybe the most interesting thing uh, to, 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 to discuss. The incapacity of contemporary revolutions for the, uh, for the revolutionary changes. The people are mobilizing and mobilizing again and again and uh, what have they achieved beyond the uh, creating the foundations for the next mobilization, which is also deficient. And, and the deficiency means that the revolutions are becoming more frequent and maybe even accelerating. That's probably this is why we are seeing more of them. This is exact, the, directly connected to the escalating crisis of uh, hegemony or the crisis of political representation. It is not solved, and so that's why we need another revolution, and then another, another, another. Uh, so uh, th th that's uh, maybe in, in, in the case of the post-Soviet revolutions, may, we, we could see in more in some sharper way some of the very basic, very general processes that may be relevant for other parts of the world. And why it is precisely the post-Soviet uh, revolutions? Because in, in case of the post-Soviet countries, this crisis of political representation could be in the um, deepest 
stage. So, because unlike uh, in, uh, in the Western countries, the uh, post-Soviet elite did not have the legitimacy, the, uh, any, anything like hegemony from the very start it emerged. Because the post-Soviet elite emerged in the process of very rapid, of uh, arbitrary uh, privatization of the state property during the Soviet collapse and uh, chaotic disintegration of, of, this, of the Soviet state. Uh, the people were seeing with their own eyes the, that process that happened in, uh, in, in, in Western Europe, the uh, primitive accumulation of capital uh, happening during centuries. In the post-Soviet case, it happened during months, most years. And something that uh, became kind of like established and taken for granted in the Western countries, in, in the post-Soviet case, was, was happening on our eyes. And, and, and that uh, process of uh, arbitrary privatization of something that was perceived as common uh, didn't have any uh, ideological or religious or traditional legitimacy. And that's why uh, the, the, the process is still after 30 years uh, that uh, passed since the Soviet collapse, uh, it, 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 there is still uh, no popular support uh, for large pri uh, private property. It is still uh, seen as, as a theft, as corruption. It's by default perceived that you simply cannot become rich in the countries like Ukraine or Russia uh, by uh, without any uh, uh, illegal and uh, illegitimate connections and exploitation of the state. So uh, the large private property is still uh, illegitimate. And uh, that, of course, undermines the power of the ruling class. And uh, the, 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 not, not going to other reasons why, why this uh, post-Soviet crisis of hegemony is so deep, but uh, just to emphasize this point, perhaps in, the, in this situation and analyzing the uh, post-Soviet revolutions, we would be capable to uncover some of the general basic uh, processes that uh, explain why uh, the contemporary revolutions are so frequent and at the same time so uh, unrevolutionary. I would like to, um, I think that brings us to the, again, what you call the, the I think the main deficient solution to this crisis of hegemony, which are the, the consolidated authoritarian regimes. Um, Russia in particular is, is, is a very important player in all of this. So how, does, how do those solutions, those deficient solutions to this crisis relate to the revolutionary uh, moments and potential really um, in the other post-Soviet countries? Is it, yeah. Yeah, uh, I would not say it as a main, but as the alternative solution. Okay. So, Caesarism uh, uh, is a conservative solution for the same uh, crisis, but uh, also a deficient solution because it simply conserves the crisis but does not actually resolve it. The, the leaders like Putin uh, uh, or Lukashenko at least uh, by this moment, and uh, there could be some changes uh, after and during the war, maybe we'll talk about that later. But uh, before that, uh, they actually could not claim the real um, hegemony within their own societies. The people who support them, it's, it's a passive support, it's a passive consent, not an, not an active, enthusiastic mobilization, 
behind uh, the uh, ruling class. Uh, Putin and Lukashenko were capable simply to stop the uh, uh, post-Soviet disintegration. Uh, to uh, unite some part of the elite, uh, providing them some of the, what's usually uh, is discussed as corrupt selective benefits, repress other factions of the elites, dissenting oligarchs, uh, the uh, um, uh, top of the post-Soviet civil societies, and also to uh, give the uh, large group of the society some stability. And, and this uh, narrative of uh, preventing the catastrophe, which is actually the uh, core of the Gramscian definition of Caesarism, as, uh, as, as, as a specific solution that prevents the catastrophe between the uh, uh, social forces that are struggling against other to the death. But unlike in, in, in Gramscian cases of the 19th century and uh, 20th century, there was the mobilized working class against a strong uh, capitalist class. In, case, in the post-Soviet case, this was uh, a balance not of the th- strong powers, but of the, a balance of weakness. And uh, post-Soviet Caesarist leaders uh, emerging in this balance of weakness and, and, and pro- solving some important, uh, play, playing an important function for the uh, disintegrating factions of the elite, providing them kind of kind of unity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, uh, n- neither Putin, nor, nor Lukashenko, nor the Central Asian uh, leaders were capable for um, genuine uh, mobilization of the active consent of the uh, uh, some, at least some of the subaltern classes. The, 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 the people who support them, support them with the motivation that it would be simply worse without Putin. What would happen if not him? If not Putin, then who? It actually sounds quite funny in Russian language. Uh, the, the, it's the same narrative of... Uh, preventing catastrophe, preventing a threat. It's not a narrative of moving forward. It's not a narrative of progress. It's not a narrative of the modernization. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's why uh, the solution is also deficient. Simply conservation of the crisis. And in, 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 in this way, it's kind of like complements the uh, Maidan uh, revolution deficient solution that um, uh, instead of conserving, reproduces and escalates the crisis. And uh, of course, they uh, work, uh, they, 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 they get kind of like a mutual legitimation for each other. Putin might scare uh, the Russian public with the consequences of Euromaidan, look at Ukraine, what happened there, uh, do we want a Maidan revolution in our country, of course not, and so uh, there is no other choice as uh, support uh, support me. The uh, Maidan revolutionaries are, of course, exploiting the obvious uh, cruelty and repressiveness of uh, Putin's and Lukashenko's regimes, and of course uh, the now escalated to this uh, bloody aggression against Ukraine for uh, legitimating the uh, um, um, Maidan mobilizations and uh, post-Maidan transformations, uh, like actually l- lack of transformations, because 
it's good that we've uh, toppled Yanukovych because he could become something like a Putin in Ukraine. Even though the actual uh, revolutionary results are so deficient, are so weak in comparison to the initial aspirations. Um, the other example you meant of, uh, or you mentioned in your in your work, of the of the Maidan, maybe as a like a, a boogeyman or something, is in Belarus and the the uprisings, um, the, the recent uprisings there. And I want to return to it because you you commented on the the labor unrest. Uh, and if if I can read from your notes, you say that it is a major development and something truly unprecedented in the context of post Soviet anti-governmental protests and revolutions and and you go on to to describe the limitations of this labor unrest um the fact that um the the, the major unions and, and the the labor leadership is is uh works with the with the state and so on and so i just wanted to invite you to comment on these variables right we have uh in this in this theoretical uh picture you're painting there's this uh, tension and even reproduction between the Caesarist regime and the and the the Maidan revolutionary states, and I'm wondering what I, I would certainly like to come back to it at the end, but whether in Belarus or in or in other countries in, in these other recurrent revolutionary moments, are there certain variables um, of interest to you, whether it's labor or something else? Yeah, uh, Belarus, uh, the Belarusian protests of 2020, uh, which uh, failed to topple uh, Lukashenko or prevent uh, prevent him to steal the elections, that more, more like precise way to phrase it, and they were indeed uh, somewhat unique in the role of uh, the worker strikes. Uh, in comparison to other um, Maidan revolutions in, in the post-Soviet countries, where the role of workers was negligible, uh, as well as uh, in Euro-Maidan revolution, where precisely the incapacity for to organize a political strike against Yanukovych uh, created... Um, uh, contributed to the dynamics uh, of uh, violent radicalization. Uh, there was no other way to topple Yanukovych in, uh, besides uh, going violent at some moment. Uh, but uh, again, in, in Belarusian case, uh, there was indeed a larger workers' participation, and, and, and it requires actually a very uh, more detailed analysis why exactly the Belarusian labor was more active. And one of the explanations, which might be superficial, but I think it's, uh, it captures uh, part of the story, is that actually the uh, limits of uh, Belarusian post-Soviet transformation when Lukashenko was capable to preserve uh, the Soviet large enterprises with the, with the same workers' collectives and preventing their destruction and stealing by the oligarchs, like happened in Ukraine, that actually uh, could contribute to the uh, um, capacity of uh, Belarusian workers for the mobilization in, in, in the opposition protests in, in 2020. But uh, the uh, scale of the uh, workers' participation was unprecedented, but at the same time, the workers uh, also were failing to articulate the workers' claims the workers' demands in 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 uh, in the anti Lukashenko uh, protests. So the workers protested, but uh, like in other Maidan revolutions, their claims were also vague, and they they were not coming from the they were, they were not connected to the immediate urgent uh, interests of Belarusian workers. And those uh, left-wing groups, 
that we're actually trying to push forward uh, more economic uh, social claims for the working class and to uh, give these strike initiatives um, more actually labor agenda, uh, they, they, they remain quite, quite marginal, unfortunately. So the, uh, the, the simple superficial uh, claims against uh, Lukashenko were dominating the strike initiatives, and they did not move further and deeper into articulations of the uh, of, of, of the interests of uh, the of Belarusian workers uh, as as actually workers, not simply the citizens who were also outraged with the uh, stealing elections by by Lukashenko. And uh, just the Belarusian case is also very interesting about this uh, mutual dynamics of uh, Caesarism and Maidan revolutions, because it also shows that uh, the, that uh, those uh, um, uh, the, the, those uh, Caesarist regimes that may look like uh, consolidated authoritarianisms are actually fragile. Lukashenko ruled the country since uh, the middle of the 90s. And he didn't even expect that scale of the uh, protests against him in 2020. The problem with the with Caesarism is that it's uh, always uh, vulnerable to the crisis of succession. The, Lukashenko may be re-elected or quasi re-elected uh, <laughs> falsifying the elections uh, once, twice, three times, four times, but eventually you get old. Eventually people are getting tired of you. Like I, they are getting tired of Putin in Russia. And uh, then you, you need to think about who, who are going to be your successor. And that, that, that should be a very careful choice because the successor should not actually eliminate you, not put you in, in prison or even uh, no, no, execute you f- and to, 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 to win uh, some popularity. The successor needs to uh, uh, retain, uh, to, to l- let you live with your property and, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, the Caesarist leader is uh, destined to, lo- to, to rule until his death. And, but then it, again, who, who would succeed? And, and this, uh, this uh, critical point of succession, of course, they, they are the points of the possible splits within the elites, because there would be definitely many candidates to get Russia or Belarus after Putin and Lukashenko. And uh, they are the points where the uh, popular mobilization against these leaders are more uh, probable. So uh, the the Caesarist leaders are not capable to create the stable structures of political rule. And that's why their solution is also deficient. We don't see, for example, any real party that Putin or Lukashenko could create, any party with any serious and uh, concrete ideology, not simply that uh, machines, the, that uh, the ruling party in Russia, the United Russia, uh, is, who, which is basically the careerists and pragmatists that would... Uh, simply stamp, uh, rubber stamp the, those decisions that are made in, uh, in, in, in by, by Putin or by his uh, administration. Even the Communist Party in China is, is ac- actually a real party. It's, uh, it, it, it cannot be so, so um, subjugated by Xi Jinping uh, the way that uh, Putin controls the United Russia. It has mm-hmm. some ideology. Even we, we may go on for like forever about how Chinese communists betrayed everything in, in Marxism, 
but the, 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 there is this communist legacy. There is something that could be appealed to like Marx, Lenin, and Mao writings uh, that that are important and uh, could be uh, appropriated also for the anti-governmental uh, positions, criticizing the government uh, based on uh, on the betrayal of those principles that the ruling party was uh, created for. Uh, the, the the ruling parties in in the Soviet countries are, are very different from that, but a party could be uh, actually a, a sta- more or less stable uh, political structure that could uh, resolve this crisis of uh, succession. There would be uh, an internal party mechanism to decide who would succeed the leader who is becoming just too old to to rule and. Uh, uh, who who is not uh, supported that much by by, by the society, and whose uh, mistakes and uh, yeah. and extravagancy I... may be actually damaging the country, as as, uh, as we uh, probably see now in in case of of Russia. I'm right. not that certain that uh, Russian ruling elite and uh, the United Russia Party uh, were aware about the start of the invasion and uh, were happy about that, considering the huge scale of the sanctions uh, that target uh, the many of of the Russian elite and uh, make their lives uh, more difficult. Right. I find um, your China comparison very fruitful, actually, for for teasing out some of these implications. Um, There are two in particular uh, I want to focus on, and maybe China will come up in both of them or neither of them, and we can come back to it. Um, The first is a phrase you use in your article, and I notice you've actually uh, mentioned it a few times on on your Twitter account, for example, as Ukraine being the northernmost country of the global south. And this is with reference to statistics, uh, or it can be demonstrated statistically, maybe with GDP per capita, COVID vaccination rate. But I'm reminded of a few, uh, the, the comparison really, really struck me. And I was thinking through what, what that might mean, especially with the idea of revolutions, nationalism, and yeah, deficient revolutions. So a, a few things came to me that I would like to ask you about. Um, the first being the role of civil society. I know that's something you've you've analyzed a few times, and that's also a often pointed to as a as a neo imperial tool in the global south. Um, and precisely the problem of nationalism in Ukraine or in Maidan revolution seems to mirror the, the question of nationalism in the third world revolutions, and per, and perhaps also in in China, which is the tension between a, a a revolutionary or civic nationalism perhaps um and ethnic tensions which within the the post-colonial nationalist project um and now just while we're talking there also seems to me i, I would like to tease out your um your idea that something about the post-Soviet crisis and the Maidan revolutions represent the deepest stage of a broader crisis of hegemony precisely because 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the third world revolutions also presented to people an idea of a representing maybe the, the, uh, the vanguard of a broader movement or something about, uh, again, the, the deepest stage of a world crisis. Um, there's a lot there, so I, I invite you to, to um, yeah, comment however you'd like. Yeah, again, that's quite, quite a lot. And just I'll, again, I'll start probably from the last question, from the comparison with the third world revolutions. The third world revolutions were actually quite different from uh, from Euromaidan, and, and uh, they they were led by the uh, vanguard parties that could claim uh, leadership over uh, some significant social groups, usually peasants, in case of, of the third world. Uh, they were violent. Uh, the contemporary revolutions more rely on the nonviolence, uh, 
at least uh, the unarmed violence. The Third World Revolutionaries were sometimes like, even strategized as guerrilla wars, specifically by Che Guevara. And uh, the, uh, the, the actually led, uh, in case of their success, to some, some fundamental changes. Cuba transformed fundamentally uh, after toppling Batista uh, government. Nicaragua as well. And the China, of course, uh, this was a great socially transformative revolution, uh, quite bloody, but also the uh, the results were very significant. It doesn't say that uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the real revolutions would necessarily and needs to be necessarily so so bloody as the the Russian Revolution or, or Chinese Revolution. And of course, we need to have must have, uh, make everything possible to to prevent the the horrors of Gulag uh, or the or, or Maoist China. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, we, we actually need to think how a socially transformative revolution uh, w- would be possible in the contemporary uh, urbanized and uh, uh, urbanized society with uh, at least semblance of liberal democratic institutions. Maybe undermined, but still, if the people can vote to change the power, they would rather vote instead of uh, going for uh, for a risky uh, revolutionary transformation. So uh, it's it's actually a very Gramscian question when he discussed the war of maneuver, the war of position. Uh, how we need to envision the contemporary war of position. Usually, uh, and qu- quite typically, it was uh, interpreted in, in, in Gramscian literature as something like f- uh, struggling for cultural hegemony uh, within the trenches of the civil society and so on and so forth. But actually, the war of position was also discussed by Gramsci as a revolutionary strategy. Not, not not simply holding uh, conferences or, or or creating another left wing website that would claim that we are f- struggling for counter hegemony and so on and so forth. <laughs> for Gramsci, this was actually simply another strategy for for a revolution that would be more appropriate for the Western European countries. Unlike Russia, where the war maneuver was possible because of the weak civil society. Yes, now we are in, in, in that situation where this uh, civil society structures became stronger. And we need to think now, it's actually the very important, most important question for contemporary revolutionaries. How to, uh, not simply to change uh, one elite for another faction of the same elite but how to think about uh, revolutionary transformation that would actually lead to, to fundamental revolutionary changes that we are actually thinking and, and uh, talking and, uh, and writing about. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 that was about the, the differences with the third world. The, the, they're actually very different. Hmm. And uh, the, uh, the the role of nationalism is also quite interesting because in in uh, in the third world revolution the nationalism was uh, connected uh, also with the idea of ideas of the national development, autonomous f- from the uh, imperialist powers in uh, the uh, Ukrainian and. In many other post-Soviet countries, uh, do we really see a progressive nationalism that would actually have a progressive development project for Ukrainian nation? 
And and here it's, it, 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 yeah, it is directed against Russia, and Russia is a re- reactionary power. But what is suggested instead? And here we see actually something very, very interesting when <coughs> the interests of the uh, imperialist power, the United States, it's actually perceived as uh, as it's simply indistinguishable from the uh, Ukrainian interest, and and the professional civil society often funded by the Western foundations and other uh, other Western donors, it's, it plays the role of, of uh, kind of like intellectuals in this uh, uh, hegemonic articulation. So what, what, what's uh, best for the United States is at the same time is best for Ukraine. And, and that's why we see, we've seen so little criticism of the uh, institutions of dependency that were created uh, after the post maidan after after the euromaidan revolution with the foreign citizens uh, in the important positions of the uh, control and audit and monitoring bodies uh, overseeing the work of the uh, state institutions in ukraine when Biden could could call Poroshenko and demand him to fire uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian general prosecutor because he was corrupt, and uh, in the United States it it, went, it was instrumentalized by Trump into that Burisma and Hunter Biden story mm-hmm. for for his electoral purposes, uh, but nobody uh, <laughs> what was. Uh, Quite a few people uh, questioned that even if uh, Joe Biden was acting in the interests of the United States, was it actually in the interests of Ukraine? I mean, in the interests of the United States, not in his personal interests uh, right. within that uh, conspiracy story about Hunter Biden. Right, right. But uh, yeah, and, and, and here we see that uh, the, this uh, US and Ukraine interest are seen as something this, the same. That, that, that's actually the, this, uh, that's the, what hegemony actually presupposes. When, when the interest of the elite are seen as uh, the same with the interests of uh, those groups that they rule over, and uh, but uh, the, the the problem is that uh, this uh, perception of the identity of uh, of the interest was not uh, actually taken by uh, other. Uh, and sometimes even by most people within Ukrainian society, at least before this bloody war started, that of course changes uh, everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, according to the polls in 2020, for example, uh, most U- Ukrainians were actually quite critical uh, about uh, the role of the United States in uh, in Ukrainian politics, and they understood that uh, they play quite a big role, and that that role may not be necessarily in the interests of of, of Ukrainian nation as uh, as such. Yeah, you you began your answer about nationalism, and actually quite conveniently ended with the role of this civil society and this identification of. Uh, of elites, <laughs> whether it's the United States or, or Ukraine. So, um, yeah, I, I, I thank you for that. That was, that was very productive. Um, I, I want to return to a few of those points, but you reminded me of the other implication I wanted to tease out, which is of the periodization you uh, propose or touch upon in your article. Um, just to quote from you, from you here, uh, one of the implications of your thesis is that the, the fall of the, the Soviet Union was, quote, not an event of particular rupture, and that the ongoing crisis uh, stretches back to, quote, uh, the degraded Soviet structures that have been declining since the end of the 1960s and have not been replaced by any stable modern structures since then. 
Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and I always ask you multi-part questions, but um, I, I really like the answers, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, and I would like you to to comment on what that periodization that that you lay out here proposes for not only the the 1989 to 91 revolutions, um, if if they are, um, yeah, how well, what that means for both the Maidan revolutions, how they relate to the 89 revolutions, are they? It, are, are they just the same process of a, of, a, of a deepening crisis? Can can we identify significant differences? Are there no p- uh, particular ruptures, perhaps until the the, the war? Um, and then the flip side of that is, um, what are the implications for the the, the post Stalin thaw of the fifties and sixties? And what I'm very curious about what uh, if that was a different era or before uh, the current crisis. What perhaps can we learn from looking back to that period, which is exactly when uh, these third world revolutions were were unfolding? Yeah, okay. Let's let let let, let me start from from the end with the post Stalin thaw. It was mm-hmm. actually a very important period when the, the there was a, a partial liberalization, which, however, didn't go that far. It's, it, it could and perhaps should have go. Uh, and at the same time, it was the uh, a period of massive mo- uh, enthusiasm and massive mobilization of uh, of the Soviet citizens. Uh, that's it's 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 it, 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 it actually very uh, well analyzed in a very well known book by uh, Russian sociologist Georgi Derlugian. Uh, the secret uh, admirer of Bourdieu, uh, which analyzes this uh, long history of the Soviet Union collapse, and he describes the how the committed communists that uh, were the result of uh, that young generation that were, was born in the Soviet Union under the Stalin's years, and it was educated to be committed Stalinists, in some sense, they uh, entered into into politics. But uh, the, the problem was that this, this 60th generation, um, who, who actually genuinely believed in... in, in, in in, in progress, in in the ultimate goal of, of communism, they were patriots of their countries, of the Soviet Union. Uh, they, this uh, wave of mobilization was uh, basically aborted by the party leadership. They were not able to integrate uh, this 60th generation in order to rejuvenate and to give uh, another impulse, uh, another push for for the communist parties. The, 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 that wave was aborted. Uh, in, in, in the case of uh, the Prague Spring, actually violently, very violently aborted. And, and that was the... the, the uh, the biggest blame of the Communist Party leadership. And that was the start of that crisis of uh, communist hegemony that uh, started about the end of 60s, beginning of the 70s, when uh, the people in the Soviet Union did stop to believe that they are actually developing anywhere, that communism is... is, uh, is something real, not simply some some uh, empty phrase in the uh, uh, party rhetoric that nobody believed in, including the party leadership itself. And th- this this was the start of, of the process when the interests of the uh, uh, Soviet society and the interests of uh, at that time communist political elite uh, started to diverge. They were not seen anymore as the leaders in the progressive development. And uh, this, 
and uh, and it had different applications. The, the very uh, ruling elite started to fragment. It was not possible to institutionalize this fragmentation. However, on the informal level, it went. Uh, it started to develop to some uh, significant scale already in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and uh, these uh, informal structures actually pre um, predetermined some of the. Uh, lines uh, how the uh, post-Soviet disintegration was going on. And the Soviet collapse itself, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, was indeed not that ruptural. If you look in the, in the longer um, uh, time scale. So the, uh, the, the 1989, uh, had some revol- actually revolutionary dimension, primarily in the Eastern Europe. It's quite questionable, actually, to, to see whether there was uh, a, a real revolution happening in the 1990-1991 in the Soviet Union. Okay, in the Ukrainian case, we, we discussed it, uh, the 1990 mobilizations as a uh, revolution of on granite. Uh, when first the students started the hunger strike uh, uh, for Ukrainian independence and to to change the prime minister, and that uh, quite quickly uh, they became supported by quite large masses of uh, then Soviet Ukraine, and the, then Soviet Ukrainian leadership uh, uh, made some concessions to them. So they, they did change the, the prime minister, and uh, but most of the students' demands were actually not fulfilled, but actually like talked away. Uh, but what, what we would see actually the continuity before and after the Soviet collapse. So the, there was there was not even the change of the ruling elite, at least in, at the initial in the initial years. Uh, the leader of the Soviet Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk, uh, was elected as the first Ukrainian president. And in a matter of months, he turned from a communist to a kind of like a moderate nationalist. And that was a perception um, by a large part of Ukrainian population that it was simply something like the, like the old uh, communist elites that we were tired of. They're now simply changing the clothes and uh, turning into supporters of Ukrainian independence and starting to speak about market reforms, democracy, and so on and so forth. But if these are the same people who are now exploiting the new opportunities to privatize the uh, the, the state property and to, to become rich. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, Mm, uh, that this uh, deficiency of of the of the rupture during the Soviet collapse was actually the uh, uh, thing that was very important for the later revolutions. So, uh, among the uh, national democratic movement in Ukraine, there was a. Uh, uh, Typical uh, argument that we actually did not win uh, the independence of Ukraine, but we we simply were, we've got it, we received it. We didn't struggle for it, but we just got it because the Soviet Union collapsed. And there was no actual real national liberation revolution. And that meant that we would need another revolution to... uh, finish that uh, course that uh, only started but was not finished in 1991 and th- 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 this uh, this explains actually the the part of partially the violence of the Euromadan revolution because it, it was actually in, in, within the nationalist movement it was actually seen that as something necessary that we actually needed to to 
to fight with violence for real Ukrainian uh, uh, independence, for real national revolution. And because we didn't uh, have it before, uh, we must uh, do it now. And that was part of the legitimacy for for Europe and then violence, at least among among the uh, radical nationalist uh, faction of, uh, of the divorce Euromaidan coalition. The reason I um, I return to the periodization is because there's something about well, on the one hand, a very popular phrase in. Um, for example, the the left in the United States, uh, where I grew up, and perhaps in, in Western Europe, is this idea of the end of history, and it's almost an assertion that um, it's almost uh, asserting that this was a lie that has been swallowed, and you must assert the opposite, and that this is pointed to 1989, the early 90s, and the fall of quote really existing socialism, and uh, by the on the other hand, the, the 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 most common or most popular reference point is that of neoliberalism, which is dated to the to the nineteen seventies, and it seems like that there must be some. This leaves a gap, right, between between what's going on. So, so what history was happening from the start of neoliberalism to the to the so called end of history, and there's something about. Um, I think the periodization you propose in your in your work. And this idea that there's a certain apolitical stability that is, I say apolitical in the sense of exactly what, what you've been describing um, throughout our conversation, that the political legitimacy or representation rests on, not on maybe a political force, but on, yeah, stability in itself. And that this is a... I, I like the way that you incorporate uh, this, the, the post-Soviet, or I guess at that time, the ongoing Soviet crisis and the then post-Soviet crisis within this broader um, worldwide development of neoliberalism and I think a broadly political crisis. And the reason I bring it up is because it seems to me that there's a little bit of tension between, I think some people can look at uh, the crisis in like let's say the post-Soviet crisis in general, and think of the uh, terrible state of the left, or the left is small and marginalized. But at the same point, at the same time, there's something about the deepest stage of this crisis, or the most uh, uh, ext- intense manifestation of a worldwide crisis that represents an opportunity for building exactly the kind of political project that's necessary not to overcome a an alternative political project but exactly to break through the worldwide crisis of a political stability or management um which is why i i kept returning to it maybe i'm not sure if you would still like to comment on how china fits in because they're exactly th- their role in this beginning of neoliberalism and the end of maoism is uh, a specific thing um but yeah, I found it. I found it very useful. Oh, yeah, but what what's the question? Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah no, there's no question. Long, so just, yeah, um, because I just lost the question. Yeah, yeah, no, there's there's I, I didn't I didn't end on a question. Um, I would ask you then then my final question, which uh, takes into, which incorporates all of this, I think, which is how can we break this vicious cycle that you describe? Um, you point to two interrelated. I, I see two interrelated points at the end of your 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 recent piece. Um, I'll just quote them. Um, the first is that quote an escalation in geopolitical competition. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you write quote we hypothesize that it may not come from within, either below or above, but rather from the outside during an escalation in geopolitical competition. In parentheses, a new cold war. The reason. Uh, uh, you go on to say is because this would provide an existential threat to the entire class of political capitalists in Ukraine, not just individual oligarchs, and that forced cooperation from above could result in, quote, more successful hegemonic politics from above could give a model and open opportunities for counter hegemony from below, uh, end quote. And 
this certainly takes on new light uh, or <laughs> takes on a new meaning in, in, in the light of the invasion. Um, and I'd like you to maybe explain how that would work. What does uh, relying on or or looking out for more successful hegemonic politics from above in order to open opportunities for for counter hegemony from below? What would that look like? And yeah. also what, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's maybe the most important question. So now, yeah, directly uh, related to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so what we meant about uh, insufficiency of the solutions from below and from above, uh, that uh, some people, for example, uh, believe that uh, these, uh, yeah, although the, the formal uh, civil society is weak uh, in post-Soviet countries, these professional NGOs that uh, uh, very much dependent on the external sources of fun funding and not uh, and not capable to mobilize large uh, groups of Ukrainians of post Soviet societies in general. That uh, if you don't stick to these uh, professional NGOs part, but look at the uh, various informal initiatives uh, that unite uh, the citizens around some local problems, and that of course that there are many of them, and there may be even a growing number of them. Uh, that maybe this uh, this is something a way forward. That people people are in that or another way um, gathering together. They starting to discuss common problems. They start maybe starting to politicize, and uh, uh, that's that's one of the uh, typical explanations where a different kind of politics may emerge in post-Soviet countries. Another uh, uh, hypothesis would be that uh, maybe the, those Caesarist stability is not that deficient. But uh, it's something that would be necessary for modernization of post-Soviet states. And uh, so far as Caesars are capable not to, to capable to prevent further escalation of the crisis, they are actually playing some progressive role. Uh, in both these answers, there is a common assumption that uh, uh, there is a background process of uh, post-Soviet modernization. That's actually, both, both, both answers share uh, an actual anti-communist assumption that, that, that Soviet modernization was somewhat deficient, was some, 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 somewhat insufficient or wrong, because it's it failed, after all, actually. Uh, but uh, what we've seen in the post-Soviet uh, period was not actually the, a different kind of modernization, but mainly demodernization, destruction of the uh, Soviet achievements. And uh, nothing uh, really... No alternative on on that scale that could could substitute the failed uh, Soviet project. Nothing of that emerged, and this is like the, like the ABC definition of the organic crisis: the old has died, but the new has not uh, born. So. Uh, uh, our hypothesis, and of course this is only a hypothesis that we, we end our analysis, and it may be true, it may be, it may be false, but it, it's, it's based on some of the um, very interesting theories uh, that were recently uh, proposed by Beverly Silver, for example, and the world systemic uh, researcher, and, uh, and she's she's known for her book Forces of Labor, a global analysis of labor unrest and its development through like more than hundred years and connection to the 
imperialist competition, the world wars, and so on. And also a sociologist, Dylan Riley, his analysis of the uh, civic roots of fascism in Europe. Uh, and an analysis of fascism as a response to the organic crisis of the 19, 1930s uh, Europe. And uh, based on these uh, very interesting theories, uh, what we would predict that uh, what we see now, the uh, escalation of inter-imperialist uh, competition between the United States, China and Russia, uh, one of the, yeah, the, the, the latest developments is actually the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that uh, the requirements of the uh, of, of this rivalry would push, or could, at least could push, the uh, ruling classes in the imperialist countries to uh, start to rule in a different way. Not simply to rule, but also starting to lead. Because they now they're actually demanding more from the subaltern classes, and the subaltern classes have have uh, more and more grievances against them. But at the same time, they, for example, in in Russian case, they are required to fight for some imperial ambitions of of Russia and die for quite. Uh, Awake things, something like denazification of Ukraine and other uh, ideological bullshit that that Putin is telling on 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 TV. Why would they? Especially if if this war uh, would last much longer than uh, perhaps uh, the Kremlin strategist uh, planned for. Uh, what would be the reason for Russians to to suffer all those all that impact of uh, very strong sanctions, the to tolerate the increasing number of casualties in Ukraine? How even if they would win in Ukraine, and even if they would uh, be able to occupy a large part of Ukraine, uh, how they are going to sustain the governance? in the occupied Ukraine, even if they install uh, some kind of like Russian puppet government that would be of very low legitimacy uh, and would meet uh, not only armed resistance, but probably very regular and strong unarmed uh, mobilizations. Because it's even difficult to to to, th to think which group within uh, Ukrainian society would win from Russian occupation. It just makes the life worse for everyone in Ukraine. So, uh, I so uh, our reasoning is that uh, I the, the in this case Russian government uh, would simply collapse. And Putin made the gravest mistake in his life with this invasion. And he would be removed uh, either in, uh, in, in the massive protests uh, in Russian society, but maybe more, more probably by uh, uh, an elite coup d'etat against him in case he would be uh, defeated in, in, in Ukraine or that the impact of sanctions would be that, uh, that harsh. Or the very political order in Russia must change and to move to something like uh, uh, an attempt to, for, for a genuine solution for the crisis of hegemony for a conservative hegemonic project that would combine, at least partially, the interests of the post-Soviet elites with the interests of the subaltern classes in post-Soviet societies. And that would uh, create an opportunity, uh, finally, for stronger counter-hegemonic uh, 
projects uh, from below, from the subaltern classes. And we've seen uh, before in, in the history of, uh, of the 20th and of the 19th century that the uh, moments of the intense, uh, the most intense inter-imperialist competition during, uh, during uh, and after the First World War, during and after the Second World War, they led afterwards to the uh, greatest expansion uh, in the interests of the uh, of the working classes. So the working classes in Western Europe won the eight hours day after the First World War, after they suffered so much in 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 in, in that bloodshed. And the welfare state in Europe was built after the Second World War. After, yeah, even 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 larger bloodshed. And uh, so the uh, so far as the uh, post-Soviet ruling elites would would try to not simply to rule the the, the way they used to with non-ideological, cynical, pragmatic politics that they, nobody actually believes in in, 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 in that bullshit of denazification and, and, and so, so on. But if they would be pushed to start ruling in a different way, that would create an opportunity for the uh, counter-hegemonic project from below that would address that gap between the hegemonic claims of the ruling elite and and the reality, and maybe uh, Russia or even the larger post-Soviet space would become again a birthplace of another great social revolution of the 21st century, as right. it happened in the beginning of the 20th century in 1917. That. Uh, that provided a model for many uh, uh, greatly transformative social revolutions in the third world uh, that dominated the history of, of the 20th century. Um, I don't know a better place to, to leave it, um, so we'll leave it right there. I certainly, yeah, with that, um, I want to thank you again for your time and for your work, uh, I and I'm sure the others at Cornish Beatty wish you and yours the best. And yeah, uh, we, we will have uh, information in the in the show notes for people who want to to read your your academic work or follow you on Twitter. Uh, and I believe on Facebook you're also quite active. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed, on Facebook, Twitter, and, <laughs> yeah, academically too. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting uh, conversation, and I enjoyed it a lot. And it helped, yeah, to, yeah, to sharpen some of my arguments. <laughs> sure, very fruitful for 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 me, and I hope for our listeners too. <laughs>